So let's go. Um, so, hey, my name is Andreas Jürgens. I'm the CEO of Freedom Today Network. Um, we are here again uh, for a very important topic. Um, this time we have Moshe Gorin, uh, live from uh, Jerusalem in Israel. Hey, Moshe, good to have you. Good to be here, Andreas. Thank you very much. Hey, Moshe, uh, let's uh, right start with what happened last, the, 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 the last Saturday, was it? Was it the last Saturday, if I'm correct? Yeah, Saturday morning. Uh, this, 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 uh, exactly, seven seventh uh, of October. Uh, I will I will call it right away uh, the nine eleven of Israel. Um, would you agree first of all, and second, tell us your experience when you woke up that morning? Um, I definitely agree. Uh, it's even worse if you compare it to population because uh, basically, very quickly, we understood we had over a thousand people dead, and you compare compare that to population of other countries, it would be equivalent to. 30,000 Americans dead, um, which is a preposterous number. Um, so basically, um, what happened in Saturday morning for, for me specifically, since I live in Jerusalem, I'm a little bit away from the combat zone itself. But still, that morning, we received rocket fire, which happens a bit quite rarely here. So I woke up 8.30 in the morning uh, with an alarm. I got out of bed, went down with my wife to the shelter. And very quickly, we understood that something was happening in the South. Uh, we started to see a news re a reporting. And we saw that not only was there a very heavy rocket fire in the South, but also people were reporting infiltration of hundreds, maybe, and even thousands of terrorists in the South that were shooting people in the streets of the towns of the kibbutzim, uh, gunfire at innocent civilians in parties, um, people that were stuck in their houses in safe zones that were being uh, smoked out by uh, Hamas activists that were basically burning their, their homes on them. And very quickly we understood we were in a completely different event than we, what we were used to. Um, this was incredibly traumatic for us because we never thought something like this could happen. We were used to having a round of rocket fire every few years, maybe an operation in Gaza to stop it, and it would end in that usually. But never could we imagine that we would have such an attack on our towns uh, from people that were crossing the fence in such an amount and in such a way, so aggressively, and with such brutal violence, basically, against innocent people. So what what was the moment when you realized, okay, this is a kind of invasion, this will be really, really horrible, and the situation is really serious? And what was re your reaction? Um, very quickly, uh, people in, in the news started to report, basically, of uh, people from the South that were either calling for help or reporting to their families that they were being shot at or they were being uh, chased by terrorists in their towns. Um, gunfire in the in streets of Zdelot. At some point, the Hamas operatives took over the police station of Zdelot. And start, we started to hear these, re these reports and that the army wasn't able to contain everything. Because basically, a lot of the army bases themselves were also attacked and taken over. Uh, many of our soldiers were taken hostage very quickly. Um, so this, when these reports started to come in, we understood that this was a disaster happening and that something larger than anything we could imagine uh, had occurred. And this was basically the worst day since Kristallnacht for the Jewish people. Um, do you think it was also um, like planned from Hamas to do it on a on a holiday because Saturday usually is is a holiday in Israel? Um, as far as I know, the, how Hamas strategy works, they are very much aware about how the Israeli uh, year and Israeli uh, daily life works. So I think they had a very big incentive to do it. They knew that many bases would be less populated, will be less on guard, and a lot of people would be at home with their families also. So it was a good opportunity for them to attack the towns themselves when people were uh, in, in their t in home with, at home with their families. So I think they, it was very much planned. And if we assume, and I think it's very clear to assume that Iran was involved in the planning of this, so they very much know exactly uh, how does the Israeli year work, basically. Mm -hmm. um, 
so uh, after a few hours in a few towns and after a few days, uh, the IDF took control again over all parts of Israel. Uh, mm. During that time, the situation must be super scary, uh, unsafe, uh, etc. So what was your impression of what's going on in the country and what's going on with the population? Do you unite like, you know, like you could see it before in Ukraine, for example? Um, basically, uh, at the beginning, we were losing our minds because we were hearing more and more stories that were just shocking and we, we were completely depressed from what was going on and being unable to help directly, at least at the beginning. Um, and, and slowly things started to get arranged. So a lot of people started to um, arrange donations, go to do uh, their, um, to recruit themselves to uh, reserve duty, um, people trying to donate to help, to uh, get uh, to invite people from the south to their homes if they needed to get out from wherever they were. All these things started to happen, and Israeli society really got together in order to help out as much as they could in those first few days. But it was cha very chaotic because everybody was trying to help, and there was very little coordination between a lot of different civil society organizations. So it took a few days until things started to become more clear and more organized. Uh, but it was mass hysteria until we got a hold of the situation a little bit more and basically could start to get control of the initiative as well, in the military sense as well. Um. So uh, then after a few days, um, I, I remember it from Ukraine. So in Ukraine, yes. you are stuck. Ukraine. Okay because it was similar to the pictures I saw live when I was in Butcher or in Irpi. Um, would you compare to, it in a way uh, also? I'm sorry to stop. You You froze for like two minutes there. So if you could repeat the, that last part. Oh, the last part. Oh, sorry. So I said, um, when I saw the first, uh, so after after a few days, uh, you recaptured all the all the kibbutz, all the towns, all, all the police yes. stations. Uh, and then uh, I know how it was. So first of all, everybody is happy that something is liberated or taken over again. But then you have seen the pictures which haven't even going viral around the world, but there are stories of horrible crimes, horrible, I wouldn't even call it war crimes because, I mean, war crimes needs to involve some human behavior, I would call it. Here we would call it a pogrom, basically. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was live. Uh, I was by, by myself uh, when when Butcha was liberated, or Irpin, or other towns in in Ukraine. Um, would you compare a, a situation like that to? So you were asking me about uh, when people uh, basically managed to con to conquer the cities back and the towns, and they saw the, the what, what happened there. Um, so is it comparable to what happened in Ukraine? I think definitely. Um, seeing the amount of destruction, the homes that were burned, the cars that were shot at and burned, uh, the bodies around in, in the streets of Bay, um, all those things, those are massacres that we had never seen in Israel since our last wars that the major ones were in the Yom Kippur War in the 70s. So no one from my generation knows that type of massacre in our streets. And, and definitely, I, I think it's something that the Israeli public uh, will not just let go by because we are angry and traumatized beyond anything we can even describe. So we want Hamas to be out of the picture and obliterated, basically. So we will not rest until that happens. Um, do you do do you think what, what whatever comes now? Uh, do you think it will be a rational decision, or will it driven by also anger, fear, revenge? I think that the the public is very much in pain and is very much angry. But still, we act in 
as a country that has leadership and has a, a military protocol and, uh, and commanders. So, and there, there are very uh, clear rules on how we fight and how we make war. And this, decisions will be made on a tactical level uh, to basically defeat our, our enemies uh, and not for revenge. Because basically we want to make Hamas disappear. We have nothing against the people of Gaza themselves. But if we need to be aggressive in order to make Hamas disappear, that's what we will do. Um, so can we talk a little bit about the history? Uh, let's talk about a little bit the history of your country, about Israel, when it was founded, <laughs> and the long history, which is more than 3,000 years old. So Definitely. Would, you start, would you start with, a? I would call it a, a nice topic in that case? Okay, um, basically the Jewish people was uh, evolved and developed its, most of its history in the land of Israel. Um, over here we had our first kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea. Afterwards, um, we had two temples, the first and the second. Um, we had a culture that brought to the world what is known as the Old Testament, um, that I think most of the world knows what, what is. And our language is from here. Hebrew. Our most sacred texts were written here and basically our culture grew up here. It's the only place where we ever had a real autonomy as a people that defined our own, uh, our own history. Um, so despite being in exile for the better part of 2000 years, the Jews never stopped thinking about the land of Israel, seeing it as their homeland and praying several times a day to the return eventually, eventually to this uh, land. So uh, as the years passed and uh, nationalism started to be a thing, so the Jewish people started to think, okay, uh, we see that we are not managing to be uh, equal citizens among the nations. Uh, so what should we do? Um, and basically the idea of Zionism was born to basically have an effort as a nation to return uh, and have an autonomous uh, entity in the land of our history, the land of Israel. Uh, throughout all those years that we were in exile, though, there was always a Jewish presence of sorts uh, in the land. So even when there was the Crusades and the Crusaders came here and massacred a lot of Jews, Jews still stayed in the land of Israel. When the Muslim conquest conquered the land of Israel, Jews still stayed here even as Dimi, uh, that is basically uh, subjugated minorities that needed to pay a tax in order to, be, to survive under Muslim rule. Um, but still, under all these different empires that ruled the land of Israel, we Jews still stayed here and thought of Israel as their homeland. And eventually, the work of the Zionist movement came to fruition uh, when, in after the Balfour Declaration of 1917, in which the uh, Lord Balfour of Britain basically promised the Jewish people to create a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. Uh, the, they won the First World, World War and the mandate, the, the British mandate of Palestine, as it was called, uh, uh, took control of the land. Basically, that's where we started to have the biggest steps towards having a nation. And in 1948, when the British basically decided to end the mandate and uh, make the partition plan of the land of Israel between a Jewish and an Arab state uh, a reality, basically, that's when uh, the state of Israel declared its independence a few months later after fighting a civil war with the lo local population for several months uh, since the 29th of November of 1947 when the partition plan was declared. Um, so after these months of fighting and the declaration of independence on the 15th of May of 1948, uh, the state of Israel as we know it nowadays in its modern form it was born. And ever since the state of Israel uh, has tried in endless ways to live beside its neighbors uh, peacefully, but always either the local Palestinians themselves or the Arab nations around us have been unwilling to uh, live beside us in peace. Uh, that came to be in several wars, in, the, in our, our War of Independence, the Six Day War, the War of Yom Kippur, the, and several others afterwards, in which basically Israel needed to fight for its existence from foreign invasions and also inside uh, troubles from the local population uh, over here. Um, so that's how we eventually arrived to the, re the reality in which we are today. The Gaza Strip was under Egyptian control between 1948 and 1967. Um, they were basically second-class citizens under Egypt 
Um, they never got Egyptian citizenship under that control, and uh, they were treated unfairly. And when in 1967, both Egypt and Jordan uh, uh, invaded Israel, so and Israel managed in, in six days to conquer those areas that were under conquest of Egypt and Jordan. So all those people that would nowadays we call Palestinians uh, came under Israeli control. And uh, basically, and for the most part of history since then, they were under a type of uh, civ civil autonomy under the military army until in the 90s, uh, the Oslo Accords basically created what we know as the Palestinian Authority that took control of both some areas in the West Bank and the majority of Gaza. Uh, after being several years in Gaza and seeing that nothing was uh, working, there were still a lot of attacks, a lot of uh, mortar fire coming from Gaza cities to the Israeli towns close to it, uh, the Israeli government decided in 2005 to one-sidedly leave the Gaza Strip, and that's what we did in what was called the disengagement plan. Uh, over After that, 3,000 Israelis uh, were taken out by the Israeli army from the Gaza Strip, and ever since, the Gaza Strip has been a completely autonomous Palestinian territory. Um, but very quickly, the uh, Gaza Strip was taken over by force by Hamas, who later held elections and was elected as the government of uh, the Gaza Strip, but they haven't been re-elected since 2006. So they still rule there as a dictatorship, uh, and they are a terrorist organization that in their uh, charter on which they were based, they swore that they will not accept a peaceful solution with Israel and they want to liberate Palestine from river to sea, which means the obliteration of the Jewish state in any type of form. So we are dealing right now with a group that is the official government of Gaza, though they rule dictatorially, but still um, they, they want us to disappear. So we have, this is not a partner with which we can negotiate peace, because they just want to see us dead. Let me ask you a few questions. So the first question, why is the leadership of Hamas not in, ha not in Gaza? Oh, the leadership of Hamas knows that we have an, an ability to reach a lot of places in Gaza uh, through our military and intelligence apparatus. So they know that if they want to stay safe, so they need to be under the protection of their allies, which in this case would be Syria and Iran which are regimes are both dictatorships that also would like to see Israel disappear. Also, also maybe mentioning Qatar because... Qatar, uh, yes, definitely. Qatar is one of the biggest finance, uh, finance hubs for Hamas, and they very much support um, Hamas and their, and their uh, objectives to uh, destroy the state of Israel. So a lot of the leadership of Hamas also has been hiring in Qatar for quite a while. Uh, another question, was there ever in the human history a state of Palestine? No. The, in, what we call Palestine is a geographic term uh, that was given by uh, Emperor August, Augustus, if I'm, not cor if I'm correct, after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem and uh, Judea at the time, and in order to basically uh, disconnect the land from its Jewish history, so it, they, call it, it, they called it Palestine in order to connect it to the Philistines that used to live in the area of Gaza, uh, actually. And uh, basically, that is the term that it was Roman, was used basically by the Western world in order to refer to the area geographically. But there was never an independent entity uh, that was called Palestine. It was all either a geographical term or uh, the term of the British Mandate of Palestine after the First World War. There was never a people who dis defined themselves as Palestinians until, until the beginning of the 20th century. Um, can you maybe also explain, so there's a Gaza Strip, uh, people who don't know how the area is. So it's in the, it's in the southwest of Israel. Um, and uh, also everybody knows Israel has the so-called Iron Dome. Can you explain to, to the people who are listening that the Iron Dome is not working close to the Gaza Strip? And why is it like that? Basically, the Iron Dome is a defensive system. It basically intercepts rocket fire in midair. So the way that it works, it basically calculates where is a rocket coming from Gaza or where, wherever is going to land and it intercepts it in a place that would be ideal in order to minimize 
possible uh, damage to property or people. Um, so since it is a missile system, it works in an angle and it does not hit Gaza at no point because by the time it intercepts the rockets from Gaza, they are way outside of it. Gaza is a very short strip of land. It's just a few kilometers wide. So the moment that they shoot, within a few seconds, the rockets are already way outside of the range of Gaza. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 that's what people don't understand mostly. Um, the people who are living close to the Gaza Strip, how long is their time to reach a shelter? If um, it's a regular rocket. Um, for people who live very close to it, it's about 20 seconds. And for, for people who live farther away, like Jerusalem, it's a minute and a half. Uh, Still, it's then, very little time in many cases. And also, uh, they have a lot of mortars, which is, from yes. my experience, not really too def it's undefendable. I mean, how, how shall you defend a mortar? Yes, the, against mortars, it's basically, um, you need to be very close to a shelter because that can, that can be seconds, 10, 15 seconds, and that's it. Um, if you live in Sderot, that's basically the experience that you have, because they are the first line against the, um, the fence, basically, with uh, Gaza. Uh, just a question uh, also for the crowd. So, uh, you, have you been serving uh, by yourself at the IDF? I served as a tankist in the IDF. Uh, I had a medical issue that basically uh, released me from reserve, reserve duty. Uh, but yes, I was a tankist in the 7th Brigade. brigade. Um, of, of Israel, and I was involved in other operations in the past as a combat soldier, and I definitely know how is that experience and how does that part of the conflict looked as well from first hand. Uh, so let's talk about uh, a little bit about uh, the near future. Uh, so do you think there will be a ground offensive of Israeli troops? Or? Um, the way that I see it, I think it's unavoidable because there is no way to clean uh, an area from enemy combatants by the air, because you never know where somebody might be. He might be underground, he might be on any other place. So if you really want to make sure Hamas is out of Gaza and completely uh, disabled from being able to do anything like this again, we will need to have people on the ground going building by building and making sure they are clean of Hamas activists and, and Hamas infrastructure, because I see no other way in how we will be able to obliterate Hamas, uh, if not from the ground. Uh, let's let's talk about a little bit the situation. How is it in Gaza? Like if you go uh, as a soldier into Gaza, especially as an Israeli soldier in that case. Uh, so what can you expect? Um, basically, Hamas has created a lot of infrastructure that is uh, destined to be able to uh, attack uh, any Israeli troops that might get close to the city of Gaza especially, but also other neighborhoods in the area. They have tunnels be, uh, beneath buildings that connect to other places, either within Israel itself or in, in Gaza, in, from which they can pass from place to place, attack our troops from behind. Uh, they can. They have left a lot of mines in different places. They have snipers and also rocket launchers in a lot of locations ready to fire if we, uh, when the offensive comes. And being an Israeli soldier that enters such a place, you know that you're going to be ambushed. The question is from where and, and how severely. Uh, I think that right now we're being prepared for one of the biggest offenses from Hamas the moment that we decide to put our, uh, our troops in there. And I think that the Israeli army is already better prepared at this point to do that after we have learned a lot of the mistakes that happened in the war of 2014. Uh, so let's, let, that, that brings us to the next question. So like you said, the Gaza Strip is pretty small um, uh, compared to Israel. The Hamas yeah. also, the, their resources are limited. From whom do they get their funding? Who, who, I mean, which people support such kind of, I can't even call them humans, so... Um, basically, uh, we know about two main sources of funding that Hamas receives. One is uh, Qatar, as we mentioned, that uh, they basically are also an Islamic di dictatorship that uh, is, uh, identifies itself with the uh, goals of Hamas to uh, make uh, Israel disappear from the map. So every year, Qatar sends uh, money, million, mil even billions of dollars in cash uh, to Hamas through either tunnels or through intermediary, intermediaries. And that's one of the main sources of income for Hamas. 
And the other one is Iran, which uh, basically them being an Islamic uh, Republic that wants to Israel to disappear. They also find ways to funnel money uh, to Hamas through a lot of different corporations, uh, organizations, NGOs. There's a lot of uh, ways that they can do it. What about, what, what about all the, um, I would call it like the, the, the aid which is coming from Europe, for example. Uh, let, let's yeah. take Germany, France, Switzerland, all the other countries. For example, they give money to NGOs in Gaza to build, for example, water pipe systems. Uh, a week later, uh, I see pictures that, that they use the water, the water pipe systems for, as rocket launchers. <laughs> um, many uh, many of the European and uh, Western funds that arrive to the, the Palestinian territories in general, but also especially to Gaza, um, basically are taken by the government there and what the people eventually receive are peanuts. Uh, they receive very little of that help and uh, what they do with most of the funds is use it in order to, in order to build more military infrastructure, more rocket launchers, and th that's what basically you see. Because if you if you think about it, the Gaza Strip has received the billions of aid throughout the years from Western countries, and still it's one of the poorest regions in the world. How does that happen? It basically happens because you have all this aid that never officials of Hamas and is used to build their military infrastructure against Israel. Yeah, I mean, there's this there's this famous uh, saying. I mean, uh, the uh, I, who who said it? I think it was Golda Meir who said the conflict will be over when the Arabs will love their kids more than they hate you. So. Definitely, I think that of course, I, I don't want to generalize, but I think that in the specific type of Islam that is prevalent uh, in groups like Hamas, they see martyrdom as a value. So. If they think that obliterating Israel is worth to die and to sacrifice their own families, they will do anything in order to push that goal to make us disappear, allegedly. And the Jewish people do not believe that. The Jewish people think very dearly of life. And if we can spare life and if we can do anything to survive, we will, because we do not see death as a, as a value. We see life as a value and we will protect life at, at any cost that we can. Of course, we will protect our lives first. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah for sure. I, I totally agree with you. That is also another uh, similarity to the situation in Ukraine. I mean, these people fight for their life and then Russian soldiers come. Uh, they don't, I mean, for sure they don't care because they are dead then, but their families get like $40,000. One, one, uh, a few families get $100,000. This is, this is worse than the life of their own children, which is pretty sad in a way. Um, so, uh, there, so there are also other actors. Let's talk about Lebanon uh, in the north of Israel with Hezbollah. So, yes. what is what, what is your impression? What, what's going on? Do they do you think they they stay calm, or they will also attack and use the situation? Or um, it's a, that's a very good question, and I don't have like the the proper geopolitical um, uh, background in order to be able to tell you everything that's going on in Lebanon right now. But I think that some people, especially Hezbollah and Iran, have a very big interest in creating a second front for Israel in the north, because uh, they know that that will stretch our resources very thin and basically prevent us to, uh, from being able to uh, obliterate Hamas in the south. So if they really decide to do that and open a second front, with us, we will be in a much more complicated scenario in which we need to fight uh, two different entities at the same time in a very bloody war. And that would be very tragic for all sides involved because I think at that point we will have no other choice but to be much more aggressive than we already are. Um, so, uh, can, can you can we talk in like two or three sentences about Lebanon? So, what what, what happened to the Lebanon? Uh, as I remember correctly, it used to be one of the most Christian countries in the in the Middle East. So, so what happened? Um, basically, the Lebanese constitution um, nowadays is a result of the uh, of the Lebanese civil war. The Lebanese civil war in the 80s basically was a faction war between uh, different religious groups in, in Lebanon, which you have a very big Christian population uh, and also a very big uh, Muslim population divided between Shiites and Sunnites. And all of, and these three groups fight amongst themselves 
uh, for control, for influence, for um, resources, all these things. Uh, and in the 80s, basically, they had terrible massacres backed by Syria that was backing the Muslim militias, especially. Um, and basically, the Christian population, who used to be, uh, I think, the majority or close to that, um, in many cases became a much smaller group because the Christian population basically needed to flee. Since uh, Lebanon has its own army, but uh, beside that army, there is Hezbollah, which uh, Hezbollah is a militant group of a Shiite extremists backed by Iran, uh, who basically uh, want to, A, be in control of Lebanon, and two, uh, take, uh, basically obliterate Israel being the enemy of the, their Shiite aspirations. Uh, in, in, in general, what do you think, how, uh, how, how big is the support of the Lebanese people to Hezbollah, and also how big is the support of Hamas in Palestine, or in Gaza, how do we call it? Well, I am not very knowledgeable of how fair are the elections in Lebanon, but I know that the political branch of Hezbollah is one of the biggest parties of Lebanon. So that already tells you that they have a lot of support, even if it's through, through corruption. They have a lot of political power, even if we, we're not talking about their military capabilities. Um, I think that since they had the civil war, um, a lot of people identify with Hezbollah because it represents them as Shiites. Um, so I think that's why they get uh, that support. Um, and then sadly, it's very common, even with, with amongst non-Shiites in Lebanon, to be very much against Israel and by proxy uh, supporting the actions of Hezbollah. Um, in Gaza, I think that basically I, there's a very big part of the population that would revolt against Hamas if they had the opportunity to, but they don't have either the means or the courage in order to do so because Hamas is ruthless, as we have learned. So they don't want to pick arms against them since they know that they will probably lose and be killed. Um, we have seen a lot of some uh, protests against Hamas in Gaza in, the, in the, this past year, and usually it ends in live fire against the protesters. Um, so definitely I understand why we don't see uh, more uh, opposition to Hamas in Gaza, because they are uh, a dictatorship that rules with an iron fist. In, in the West Bank, there's a lot of different groups, and it's much more complicated. Uh, I mean, to, 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 to be fair, I don't know how we would react if we would live under a situation like that. Um, uh, what, what was my next question? My next question was uh, related uh, to, to Hamas and to all these people. Um, do you think it can ever ever change in the future? I mean, the whole education is full of propaganda, of hate. I have seen videos of seven, eight-year-old children uh, who, tell, who tell to the camera how they want to stab or how they want to kill Israelis. Um, do you see there is uh, something like, like, like a hole out of that, I, I, I would call it? Um, it's very hard to tell. Um, <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but my, my last question would be like, okay, let, let's see, even you take all, all terrorists out of, out of Gaza, you kill all the people from Hamas, Do, would you agree that will create more terrorists? I believe that um, having a harsh uh, reaction to what's happening now and basically punishing Hamas for what they're doing will, of course, create a lot of resentment and a lot of people who will not have a, a lot of um, esteem for Israel because of, uh, of what we need to do. I think that is not a death sentence, um, uh, and it's not something that will basically lead necessarily to another generation of terrorism. Um, I think that if, if we really manage to take Hamas out of there and we manage to instate a different type of government in Gaza that will be much more fair towards the population that will uh, give them real opportunities um, and basically let them know that it pays to be um, a peaceful neighbor to Israel. So I think we'll be able to raise a generation that will not turn to terror necessarily. How can that be done? I don't really know. I I can think of it as a, as a type of Marshall plan just for Gaza, but I don't know if that is something that you can do in the case of Islamic extremism. But I want to believe it's something that it will be possible to do if the situation is correct. 
uh, to come uh, to another country which is not really friendly with uh, Israel and the Jews is uh, Iran. So what, yeah. do you, what can you tell us about Iran? Um, Iran, since the Islamic Revolution of the 1970s, um, has been led by a government of Islamic extremists, basically, um, who have declared Israel as being one of the biggest evils in the world, and therefore uh, they put their mission to make Israel disappear off the map. This can be seen in many ways, in, either through their funding of groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, and also in on the political arena in which they make uh, Holocaust denial conferences and also conferences saying uh, uh, of dreaming about a world without the Zionist entity, as they want to call us all the time. Um, so basically, this is a regime that is very much extreme, both for its own citizens and also uh, in their external relations, wants to see Israel wiped off the map, and they very much actively uh, do actions to fund and plan uh, attacks against Israel and to hurt our population, both civilians and uh, our government. Uh, would you agree if I would say if I, I agree with you 100% on the Iranian government, but I'm not pretty sure about the population because, you know, we have, we have for, for, for example, we have a lot of Iranians in Germany uh, and I, I know a lot of them. And from my experience, uh, they always say, believe me, Andy, we, we hate our government more than we hate Israel. So. De definitely. Before the Islamic Revolution, it, it, the regime, the king or the Shah of Iran was a very good friend of Israel and we had a very good relationship uh, with uh, Iran at the time. And I think that most of the uh, Iranian uh, diaspora around the world are very much against the Islamic Republic and, uh, and they still think of Israel in good terms. You know, of course, there's a lot of difference between them, but uh, I know that there's a lot of them that still remember the days in which Israel would, was an, a very close ally of Iran, and they they still see Israelis in a positive light. Um, Persians and Jews have had a very long history together. Uh, there has there have been Jews in Persia for over 2,000 years. Uh, since the time of the Persian Empire, and we have been in very good relations with Persians for most of history. And for me, it's very sad that the the regime nowadays is one that would put all that away and just focus on their hate for the Israeli government and the Israeli people and you know, just force their people to be involved in such uh, terrible uh, regime and hatred towards us. Yeah, I, I, from my point of view, I think the, especially the Iranian diaspora is pretty clever and they know what will, what the consequences will be of, of the actions of their government and the, this outcome will be horrible for, for, for all people. Uh, so let's, um, let's come to another player. I mean, for sure, Lebanon is the kind of player Hamas, Hezbollah and Qatar and Iran is a big player, but there's another big player in the background. It's Russia. So... What can you tell us about the influence of Russia, especially in the past, when, uh, when, uh, for example, Arafat had had huge ties to the Soviet Union, etc. Yes. So basically, a lot of the conflict we see in the Middle East, especially in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, has to do a lot with uh, remains from the Cold War. Basically, since Israel decided very much to our luck to align itself with the Americans, uh, the Arab countries uh, decided to align themselves with the Soviet Union. And we were caught up basically in a Cold War uh, effort in order to gain influence and territory and spies and intel between these two um, you know, superpowers. So, and the Soviet Union for a very long time both trained and also gave, uh, uh, gave uh, resources to groups like the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, that later on became the Palestinian Authority uh, that we know nowadays as the government of the West Bank. Um, so definitely the, the Soviet Union and later Russia have been very close allies to a Palestinian organizations, especially those that have been violent against Israel. With that said, Israel has had ties with Russia and throughout the, um, the years, especially since the 90s, because of the big Russian uh, uh, population that lives in Israel and our need to have um, better 
better strategic coordination with them since, especially nowadays, they have a lot of presence in Syria and Israel wants to be able to do operations in Syria in case that uh, we have something that we need to do militarily. So if we want Russia to be to not interfere in these kind of operations, so Israel has been trying to keep at least uh, some type of relationship with Russia and, and nowadays with the conflict in with the war in uh, Ukraine, this has been a very tense point because even though the Israeli public and most people in the Israeli government would want to openly uh, um, support Ukraine in, in weapons, in humanitarian aid in, and in the political arena as well, uh, we know that if Russia decides to interfere with, uh, with Israeli military operations in Syria, we would be in a lot of trouble. So we have, our government has kept a uh, neutral stance that uh, a lot of people have been crit uh, critical about, but of course it's something that we need to take into account when we want to take a stance on the subject. Yeah, yeah I, 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 also, I also agree with you. Uh, I, would, I would say on the other side, I mean, look, the Iranians producing thousands of drones for the Russians. Uh, yeah. So, so this is also another point. Or now there, there are a lot of news about uh, the drone production of the Shahed drones in Venezuela. So there's another access. So they they're producing it now in Venezuela and fly it directly from Caracas to Moscow. So, uh, do you do you do you think in general um, that this can 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 end in a larger conflict, or do you think it's it's already a conflict between? The, I would I, I wouldn't call it the free West because it's maybe a wrong term, but you know what I mean between the yeah. the so-called so democratic countries in the West, including uh, Japan and some others, against um, autocratic regimes. Um, I think that it plays a role in the bigger scheme of things. Definitely, um, Israel being aligned with the West, so we we definitely are part of that type of geopolitical uh, game. And uh, of course, if things here get bad enough that we'll need the help of our allies as they have already um, offered their help, especially the US. So that can lead to a lot of uh, other effects that we at, at the moment don't know. And of course, in the case that there will be an open war uh, with Iran, that right now we have a proxy war with Iran through all these different intermediaries, um, so if we have an actual war with Iran directly, I'm pretty sure that could lead other autocratic regimes to join them and lead to what would be a type of a third world war. I hope that will not happen, but it is a possibility. No, no, no. I, I mean, for sure there's a possibility also than the situation in with Russia and Ukraine, the situation with China and Taiwan. So we have we have many places in the world uh, where it's nearly burning, I would say. Um, so, but let's hope the best. Um, so, what 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 do you think? What what should Israel do from your point of view? I mean, you have a government, and like you said, you have a military structure, and they will take decisions. So, uh, what, what what's your wish? Uh, kind of wish? What 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 do you, do you want to achieve? Um, you mean in this war or in yeah, the longer term? No, 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 right right now in this situation. Right, right now. now. Okay, so right now I think that both the Israeli government and public have understood that we cannot find a peaceful solution with people like Hamas because they basically want to slaughter us. So we need to do anything we need in order to uh, make the Hamas regime and especially the Hamas military capabilities uh, disappear. Uh, that basically means to um, uh, to get in get into Gaza. Um, destroy an infrastructure over there, find the, oper the operatives, um, either jail them or deport them or just combat them until they are destroyed and do anything possible to liberate the Gazan people from the Hamas regime. Uh, and then afterwards, find those responsible for the planning of wh what happened this past Saturday over here, wherever they are in the world, and also bring them to justice. That would be that would be really great. Um, uh, I can just add uh, with all the Israelis or Jewish people I'm going to talk. Everybody tells me nearly the same. And this is, from my point of view, one of the most important things. You're just uh, talking all the time against Hamas. I never heard something against people from Palestine, for example. Uh, so it seems like you, you don't really have a problem with, with them. I, you know, you know how I mean. <laughs> 
I have no problem with anyone as long I, I, I judge people on their actions. So that's why I really uh, take uh, I take care to say Hamas and not Palestine or Gaza or whatever, because I know that there's a lot of people in Gaza that will, are not aligned with Hamas and do not support their uh, their actions or their goals. I know that there are a lot of civilians that do, but of course, People who are not part of Hamas, I cannot know that as a fact. But I do know that anybody who identifies as a Hamas operative combatant member, he identifies with the values that amongst them is the erasure of Israel as a Jewish state. So if that's why I say if, if somebody is identified with Hamas, I am for sure that he does not want me living and I would like him to not be able to do anything to me. Uh, yesterday, yesterday uh, there was a Swiss politician, he said, everybody who supports Hamas or this kind of action is, from his point of view, out of the democratic spectrum. So, I, I totally agree, with, but what do you think, you know, you're right now in Jerusalem, for sure you're watching your situation more closely. Um, do you see reactions from people in Europe or do you get a lot of messages? Do you watch TV, what's happening in Europe or in London or in Paris? Um, I have seen some, of course. I try not to be connected to the news all the time because it, it is mentally very telling. But I do see that on the one hand, there's a lot of people who have uh, showed support for Israel, especially like governments in Europe and in the US, um, and a lot of people who have been demonstrating in favor of Israel. But also at the same time, I've seen the demonstrations against, uh, against Israel and basically uh, supporting Hamas, which for me is mind boggling. Because who is the same person in the West that can hear the stories from what happened here last Saturday, see the pictures and say, Israel is to blame for the situation? Like, how evil do you need to be in order to change, to, to try to show people that are that brutal and that relentless and that violent and try to show them as victims? Like, I know that the situation in Gaza is not nice. And, it, and of course, it has been a very tough couple of decades, especially for the people in Gaza. But still, when you have a government of an area that comes and invades another country in mass and kills innocent civilians in the thousands, children, old people, women, and just the regular people in the street, how can you support that and say that, that those perpetrators are victims? Yeah, um, I, it's, it's, it's sad at the same time, and it also makes me really angry because you could see that uh, since a long time, especially with Israel, uh, with anti-Semitism, you could also see the same playbook in Russia. Yeah, uh, you know when the when the when the massacre from the Russians happened in Ukraine, it was exactly the same. There were people defending the, the this actions, and I'm really doubting sometimes if they really have a brain, or if they are just contrarians or just evil people, like you say. Yeah, and I also have seen people who are uh, just denying the things that happened here. They're saying that the videos are fake, that everything is staged, that the people in the party shot each other, which I I don't know, but mass shootings in Israel, not a thing that happens between civilians. It's not, it's, we don't have civilian weapons like that. Uh, so I've seen crazy things, and of course, I could share with everyone the videos and the pictures that I have, the, the proof of everything. But the fact that people are able to see everything and claim that it is staged is mind boggling because the amount of proof and testimonies and people who are scarred for life of what they experienced and saw in those places is, is huge. So how can anybody deny that? We're, we're experiencing a, a small second Holocaust, if I may call it that, and people are already denying it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember that when I was, I mean, I was in Butcher and was making a Twitter live video and I was standing at a mass grave. I was basically standing at this mass grave and people were commenting that it's all fake, uh, Ukrainians prepared this situation and I just got a little bit out of control, as you can imagine, <laughs> because I was standing there. So, yeah, yeah, um, but but how to how to fight this propaganda? Is there, is there a proper way how to how to fight it? Because, you know, there are two ways. First of all, the way you're doing it. So not sending around these this horrible pictures. Not Because sometimes it, it seems to me that Hamas warned it. You know, they warned that, that we share these horrible pictures. And on the other side, as a media person, I have to say, 
the world needs to see it because otherwise there will be no action. Yeah. I, I think that for people who make decisions, especially for those that that can decide if to support one side or the other, um, it's very important for them to see at least some of what happened because they are the ones who are able to, to make decisions on the international scene and to turn policy uh, in that area because that's what basically what will create international support or not. For the regular people, I say basically you need to um, talk to them, explain to them, tell them what are the facts. If they want proof, give it. And basically just not let anyone deny what happened here because the, the amount of proof is just mind boggling. It's, I, I just can't think of how anyone can still deny it despite how much evidence there is. Um, let's come, uh, let's come. I mean, I, I don't want to compare it, especially not as, uh, as a half German, so um, let's talk about the Holocaust and the experience the Jews had during that time and after, especially, um, mm -hmm. and, and today. So was it like kind of the, I wouldn't say the Holocaust of, of the young generation, but you know what I mean, like a, a yeah. situation like that. Definitely. I, even when we had our toughest times here in Israel, which we have had quite a bit, the view of seeing people dragged by force into trucks and sent away as hostages or being people being shot in the streets and then just left in the side of the road in basically mass graves is something that as a jewish people we had not had since the holocaust so for us this is a, a, such a horrific reminder of that time and to think that this is happening still in 2023 in a world that knows what happened at that time and they're supposed to be able to f fight against that level of anti-Semitism and still have people that hate us on that level to be able to do such horrific things and also be proud of it and put it on video. I find it absurd and I just can't believe that is a reality that I'm living in right now. I never imagined that I, as a person in a modern Western country, will need to see people of my country being tortured and killed and dragged as animals into trucks. Now let's uh, let's talk about uh, just a few a few sentences about the Israeli state. So the Israeli state in general is a promise given to the Israeli people and to the Jewish people wherever they are in the world. There's a safe place. Is this Definitely. Is this vision kind of destroyed? It definitely um, has shattered uh, part of that conception. On the one hand, we know that just us being here in Israel creates a lot of um, a lot of tension with our neighbors for a lot of historic reasons. And of course, we are not 100% safe being here on the one hand, but on the other, See what happens to Jews in places where they don't have a government that supports them and people who are attacked in the streets, who are lynched, who are humiliated, who are singled out in their classes in university, which is happening right now in the West. And that basically is something that makes me think that Israel might not be uh, the safest place for Jews in the world, but I don't know of any other that would be better at the moment, as hard as it is considering the situation. Um, so um, I always wanted to wanted to end an interview with some positive <laughs> positive sentence. Um, so can you tell us like an like a positive way of thinking how you handle this situation, how your friends handle this situation, and at the end maybe you can tell us. <laughs> a way um, how people can support you. We can put a link under it from a group of sure. you, you're going to support or something like that. So what, what what would you wish for to be for a future? For sure, peace. I mean, that's obvious. Definitely. And I would hope that uh, in my lifetime, we'll be able to see um, a reality in which we can live beside our neighbors, being the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab countries around us in peace and in cooperation. Um, what happened in the Abraham Accords was a very good start for that, and I hope that it will expand to other countries as well, 
when they understand that we're not going anywhere and it's better to be in good terms with us and have a peaceful relationship with Israel. That's something that I would like in the farther future. And um, basically, uh, what, what I would want from people in this situation um, is to not be afraid to show, you, show your support, uh, to tell people what is going on, what, uh, what happened to, to us, and to get, have our backs in, a, in our struggle to be able to uh, terminate the Hamas uh, government in Gaza, because we understood that as much as we have tried to just keep the situation, the status quo as it was, it just doesn't work and we just can't be beside an entity that wants us dead uh, and is able to create such violent acts. So I want the world to be able to get, have our backs in this effort to eliminate Hamas uh, once and for all. Uh, the ways that you can help uh, also apart from spreading the word and sharing the information and being a voice in our support, uh, what you can do is you can donate to uh, Israeli organizations. If you want to, to donate to civil organizations, we have um, the Red Magen David, Magen David Adom, which is like the Israeli Red Cross, which is helping people that are injured and uh, in being hospitalized right now because of what happened this past week. Um, there are organizations like One Heart uh, that help people, uh, civilians that have been affected from this whole situation all around Israel, but especially in the South. And if you want to help the military effort, so you have organizations like Friends of the IDF, and I think that also JGive, it's a website, they're doing um, a donation uh, rally. Uh, online to be able to donate to our soldiers that lack equipment and need basically that type of support as well to be able to come back and fulfill the, their missions and come back home safely uh, after defeating Hamas, hopefully. Yeah, I can I, I can just add a personal story we uh, we both share. I don't know if you remember, but uh, for, for the public, uh, Moshe and me, we know each other since a few years. And a few years ago, a friend, uh, we both share, Anna took a picture of us. Uh, with some Germans and some Israelis, and it was just a normal picture. And then she 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 published it on Facebook, and she wrote the following. I don't get it totally totally correct, but the meaning was something like, "It's it's mind blowing to see um, the people who where the grandparents killed each other, or in this case, the German grandparents killed Israeli grandparents, can now stay together and being friends. So I think peace is peace is possible." Definitely. And um, I think that one of the things that changed in Germany in that, in that case is that Germany understood what they did under the, the Third Reich and they atoned for it in many different ways. And I think nobody in Germany nowadays, like no normal person in Germany nowadays, thinks that was a good era in German history or would like to come back to it. I think that that future is also possible. Um, for our area, though when you put religion into it, it's much more complicated because it, it, you need to change a belief system that is very deeply rooted in the life of a lot of people. Um, so I do believe it is possible to change, but it will need to involve a lot of leadership, even within the Muslim community itself, and decide that that's not where they want to take their religion, and they want to have a better future with less violence and less death. I believe it's possible. I hope we'll find those leaders. Perfect. Let's finish with this sentence. Uh, thanks for thanks for having the time for us. Thanks for sharing your message. We try to help you as much as we can, um, because you know it's always it's always the right decision to to stay on the right side of the history. Thank you so, very much. You're more than welcome.